what I can add is you save every opportunity which you have in front of friends. In, and in front of friends, it's much easier and more friendly. But yeah, use use the opportunity, practice, fail, and learn. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, just practice, um, prepare as well. But going unprepared, sometimes improvising is not that bad. Then you're kind of a bit more natural and come up with some creative ways. So it's not that bad, but you have to practice. And uh, worst case, I mean, you fail and you learn. You have to be open to understand why you fail, understand the feedback. As I said, we had one demo which was quite a failure. This was the first uh, meeting with these guys, we really wanted them. And we thought that they're the best strategic partner. And uh, our latest prototype did not work. So we decided to show a previous one, it did not work. So we started charging it, did not work. So, and in the end, they, they are still interested in real communication. So it's, it's not that bad, it cannot be that bad. So make it personal. Okay, thank you. May I add something? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, you're, you, you, you stress the question as how to, manage, how, to, how to alleviate stress, for example, how to manage it. But I, I really like to take advantage of it. So stress out, hype out the maximum that we can. It's very good to be casual, but if you fail, there are well two two options. You either appear underwhelm, underwhelming, or you appear very very passionate about it. So that's why you are overhyped. You are um, skipping things. You you are you are not very much to the point, but you are very enthusiastic, and. Between being over underwhelming and very enthusiastic, the better way to fail is to be over over the top. So hyping out is uh, and and mm, uh, transmitting this stress through your presentation, I think is um, is actually making investors friendly. They they realize that you care about what you do and being stressed, you're you're freely showing your stress. So okay. we are not hiding it in some way. So we embrace stress exactly. and actually bring it out, admit it, and yeah. then uh, turn that into advantage. Leverage it. Great. Leverage. Okay. Just Great one advice. One. So may I add something that I learned just three days ago? Uh, I'm a person who likes to improvise, and at 11 we had this uh, workshop, and they said that learning things by heart help a lot. And actually, I tried it out. So when you know your text by heart you can improvise very well on it. So it is something straight to the point. When you, because whenever you learn it by heart, you know it, and you'll feel much more confident. Okay, so improvising is, works well when you actually prepare it very well. That's a great message that I try to communicate to my students before they do a presentation, so thank you guys. Uh, Milena, do you have something to add? Because you've been a judge and have been sort of the, on the observer on the other side, so to speak. I, I would uh, like to add something, I think you all touched upon it, but presentation is a skill. It is something that can be learned. You can just, there is a toolbox of things that you should know, you know, how to structure a presentation, how you um, communicate it, use this, use that. So, it is something we should not be scared of. It's something that is practiced and can be conquered. The one thing, though, that makes uh, presentations, you know, unforgettable, very impactful is when you really put your heart into it. So, if you know what you're doing, if this is something that you really believe in, then when you make the presentation, it really captures the audience. So, I would suggest this is one thing we really can learn, and this is, it is really done by effort and practice presentation. But to be right, natural and to really be successful then, you need to know what you're doing. Okay, thank you for that. Again, that reinforces why we make our students present almost in every class here, so you guys now understand the value of that. Okay, um, another very practical aspect of uh, preparing for, uh, for a pitch is um, clearly behind most of your products there's a lot of um, technical and scientific data. 
Uh, and on one side, you are probably tempted to show how serious uh, of a justification there is behind what you're proposing, but on the other side, this can really ruin your presentation. Uh, you had very little uh, uh, technical data, scientific data numbers here, um, and I think that worked very well for you. How do you balance between the temptation of showing the, 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 the serious stuff and the uh, need to actually be uh, communicating in a very easy to understand way to people who might not be in your field? I'll be short. Okay. Feedback. Talk to people, uh, because we did this presentation uh, a few days ago, and I changed it a few times, even last night, I spoke to a friend of mine, uh, he told me, do you want me to do the pitch? And I was, yeah, sure, so I did it, and he told me, well, I didn't understand this and this. So, collect feedback all the time until you reach the sweet part. Okay. Yeah, something which I can add, it, it's a kind of advice also, is... Uh, if it's possible to provide uh, information, as I mean, the less it is, it is better. I mean, in that case, you will feel more comfortable. You will have more time. Even my presentation normally was five minutes, so I mean, I just want to make it to show you the same one, but it is not working well. Even I make my feedback that use, adapt, delete, but put only this information just to give a confidence that you can improvise and you will have enough time. So probably these numbers are not needed sometimes. If you if you are, your message is to convince someone to buy or to give them money, if for him it's very important, okay, put that information but delete something else. So it's more like even having some discussions with the audience just to see what is important for them and put this slide. Okay. Sometimes, or in most cases, it's more important how you present it than what you present. So if you have nice visuals, if you make it relevant to the people you're talking to, um, if they can understand easily what you're doing, even though it's very technical, very scientific, etc., then you're good. But um, don't, yeah, you, you gather feedback and then this temptation of showing it will evaporate. Okay, thank you. So it, it really depends on the audience as well. So if, if uh, someone from the investors that you're pitching in front or the audience is really into technical details, of course go for it. But uh, technical feasibility is actually that can be proven and discussed afterwards. What you need to present during the presentation itself is the potential behind this idea and what has been done so far. And at the end, of course, make uh, a call for action and state your ask. But uh, what sits behind it? It should be just uh, mentioned and open for discussion afterwards if it's feasible, how feasible it is, how hard it is uh, to, 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 to make it happen. Okay, thank you. Milena, for you as a judge, how do you actually, especially when it comes to products or ideas which are um, in domains that you don't have uh, serious expertise in, how do you actually deal with the need to evaluate the proposition um, and uh, maybe the, the lack of technical information, or even if it's there, um, your inability to understand it because it's not in your field of expertise. Well, it is important to show enough, um, how to say, uh, validation of what you were saying. For example, when uh, one of the startups was making the presentation with uh, AO. Is, is your present okay? Your startup. Um, I I was immediately prompted to ask you how do you really prove you can actually use this device and this uh, uh, this kind of uh, you know new um, equipment? Uh, how do you actually um, position it on the market and have the customers buy it? And I think you rightly pointed out that you, you had evidence of research that you've been, um, that you collected. But also what is important in that case is to show that you have on the team somebody who is really professional or who has access to the professional network, especially with products that are in the sphere of medical, you know, even uh, well-being overall, in general. 
And by the way, this is a trend uh, in, in a lot of startups and also in a lot of companies. They are gearing their innovations in the area of well-being and healthy living. So it's something that would be necessary for almost any new startup to be validating this by having at least a person on the team who is, has the background or is an expert. And one, one way you could do that, you could actually um, expand your team by having these advisory council, advisory panel or, or uh, team members that are on a bigger board, but who could be your reference point. So it's very important when you are starting this kind of enterprises that you actually have uh, data that is trustworthy and that you make sure you are basing what you're doing on it. Okay, thank you. So, in essence, you don't really need to show the technical data, but you need to signal that you either have access to that expertise, maybe through an advisory board or through yes. an yes. expert network, or yes. that somebody in the, on the team actually has that expertise. Okay, excellent. Um, I see that we have questions. Um, they're not directly related to pitching themselves, so I'll leave them at the end because um, I understand that there's interest that relates specifically to the, uh, to the business ideas and the products that were presented here. Uh, but I would like to keep the focus now on pitching itself and the practicalities of this. Um, I wanted to ask you something else. Um, a lot of, um, I know a lot of our students and a lot of entrepreneurs when they prepare uh, for a pitch, they're afraid that they might um, be faced with some unfriendly questions or challenging questions. Uh, investors frequently are painted as these mean creatures who are there to make you feel miserable. Have you experienced unfriendly fire, so to speak? Um, and uh, if yes, how you dealt with it? If not, how you would deal with it if you were in a situation like this? I will, I will not say it was unfriendly, but it's like uh, our product is very specific. We have a very conservative uh, client, it's the municipality. More or less each time I'm challenged with that. I mean, every time people are coming, okay, do you know them? Because in, even in Bulgaria, in the startup world, world everyone is preventing dealing something with the municipality and government. So I know what is their main concern, so that's, that's the one I put traction there and just say uh, what, what I'm saying, where we are. Normally after that they have some discussion, but then they are much more positive because they see that we spend time uh, speaking with this government uh, authorities. So it's like, uh, yeah, we have it, we know it, and we are prepared for it, and we also put the information initially in advance because we know what are the main uh, concerns which can arise for our problem. Okay, so in your case it's interesting because the pitching actually that's challenging involves a partner that you need for the business to work rather than the investors themselves. And you're absolutely right that uh, when you need to partner with institutions or organ organizations which are as conservative as municipalities, um, how you present to them is uh, absolutely important. So thank you for the great example. Okay, some other examples of uh, dealing with uh, challenging situations? Um, I would like to add that uh, the challenges, challenging questions are actually good because uh, they show that investor has an interest. If uh, they don't have an interest, they politely um, put you right away. Uh, and uh, if they have a challenging question, that is a very good and positive signal uh, that I would like to add discussion. Uh, because we are working on our startups full time and we are so committed on it, um, I don't think that it's possible for somebody to ask a question that you're not prepared of because uh, we are so into it. So if you're doing a presentation, uh, the one thing you're trying to do is actually raise the questions and you anticipate the questions because you orchestrate your presentations in a way that you will know what questions will be asked by the audience. And in an investor case, um, you spend so much time preparing that you actually know all the answers to all of the questions I'm going to say. 
Okay, well, that's a great advice. Uh, for, Preparation. Yes, and for um, young entrepreneurs to understand that they are the biggest experts on their startups and their ideas just because they're the ones who are 24-7 in it. And so to be confident about the fact that they should be able and they know the answers to all questions. Okay, great suggestion. Any other? Another good advice is because you usually get more or less the same political questions every time from investors especially, but you can also try to um, kind of reassure that that's going to be the case by um, structuring your presentation and slides in a way that you are kind of touching upon certain um, aspects that you would like to get a question about so that you have more time to explain exactly this question. Um, because you usually have very limited time for Q&A and if you spend this time on questions that you're confident about and then you can convince them, it's even better. So sometimes it's better to leave out some things, just touch upon that, than giving some information which is not enough so they can make their own impression which might be not the right one. Okay. Also, as Sylvia said, it's, uh, you, you frequently anticipate the questions. So, while in the main storyline of the presentation you need to include only this much information, it might be wise to include backup or pocket slides to bring up when you are faced with this question. So, it, it shows really preparation, yeah, it shows that you anticipate this question, you give the audience or the investor the chance to give this challenging question, to pose a challenge in front of you, and then you, you actually bring your trump card with this uh, backup slide and it really makes a good impression that you, you have it, you have the in line. Okay, thank you. Elena, do you have any word of advice in this, uh, on this topic? There will always be somebody who has a bad day, you know. <laughs> so the most important thing is uh, to be actually uh, open-minded and to come up usually the best approach is because you, you Despite of the fact that you're working so hard on this, there could also always be a question that you don't know the answer for. But the important thing is that you, you take it seriously. First, with investors, you really take all of the questions seriously. And you try to uh, pursue a further answer. You say, we follow up, you, you ask for more information, so you make the person feel that you respect their opinion and, uh, you, you know, even the time that they're taking to discuss, to take time for your idea. So it's an important, important thing to have that attitude, which is, um, you know, you take that for serious, you address it, and you come back. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to turn now to the questions that are um, here on the screen and I will kindly ask you to give uh, very focused and brief answers to that um, so that we can conclude the session with uh, messages on uh, pitching. So the first one is how can old people who uh, don't own or know how to use a smartphone use Tiki to commute? Yeah. Uh... There are such questions we, really, we get used to. Normally we are seen, seen as an alternative distributor channel. So we understand that we are not, uh, comp we are not covering all, diff all, all channels for distribution. So this is the alternative. It, it, it can facilitate everyone who have a smartphone, who is traveling, who is in different cities. He, they can use on only one app. And that's all. Thank you. So next question, uh, when would you wear the eye glasses? Uh, during sleep or during the day? Um, you have to wear them with eyes open and depending on the situation you might wear them during the night if you want to be more active in the night or you have to wear them in the morning to be more active in the morning and you have to wear them for 20-30 uh, minutes depending on the case. Okay. Practical question, um, how can overweight people use cook now? Uh, very easily, unfortunately, I don't have the product here to show it to you. But, <laughs> but the way it is, it is mounted on the toilet ceramics, so the weight is evenly distributed on the ceramics, so it's as if you're uh, using a standard toilet seat. Okay. Well, although we haven't done the, the testing with the 200 kilo people, so probably I'll be able to better answer this question in about a month. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you tend to prevent people from uh, using public transportation without paying for a ticket? That's for Tiki. Yeah, we, we, we have uh, different uh, scenarios. So this one is, uh, yeah, we are 
because we know when you enter into the bus at what time. So we will we, we put the link. So within a, a five minutes you need to buy a ticket if not but also there are different scenarios which we are we are working on so we understand that security is very important for us and we are yeah we are really focused on that okay. um, question to cook now what about the competitors have you heard of squatty pot do you have a strategy on that yes of course uh, by the way the team learned for squatty party after inventing the product uh, we actually like very much Squatty Potty because it, ex it shows that there is a potential for this thing. And they uh, just uh, received 7 million uh, US dollars from Shark Tanks. And when they're still uh, based in the US, they have proved the, the market. And the good thing is that the market in Europe is still underserved and people are not aware. So yeah, we know about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we're going to shift back to pitching. Uh, do you run a background check on the people you will pitch your ideas to in order to adjust your presentation correctly? We kind of touched upon that, but do you actually do a background check? Yes? No? That was a general story. It's important to understand the background of uh, the audience, of course. If they are more techy, you have uh, to prove. Uh, to prepare your slides to be more techy, if they're more busy, you have to pro provide them with. Um, if, of course, it's important. Uh, okay. If they uh, came from the same domain, you have to be a little bit more specific and answer uh, their questions in the presentation. Um, so you have to have a look on their domain, what are they investing in, and uh, their background. Okay. I can, I can give an example. So this next Thursday we are having uh, we are going to have a presentation in Burgas in front of the municipality and deputies there. So what we did, we know who are they, we know their habit, and the presentation looks like the old-fashioned way. Yeah. Big uh, sentences explaining what we are offering. This is only just and here the background it's important because we know what kind of presentation they are they are looking at, so we just don't want them to be, uh, we, we want to be on the same uh, page with them. So, it is important to know who are you having in front of you, so the background is important. Okay, some other advice? No? Okay. Alright, so uh, we're moving on to sort of uh, generalizing our uh, advice here. Um, there was a specific request uh, to give your top pitching advice um, that uh, uh, you walked out it from your training um, in the US during SEP. So what did you learn about pitching specifically from there? One piece of advice is uh, be careful with the jokes because um, I had an unpleasant experience with making a joke that didn't turn out quite well and then the whole presentation kind of slipped on the other side. And of course, be prepared. Okay, so the use of humor needs to be very, very well planned and thought yeah, out. Okay, um, can we then summarize uh, your key advice uh, that you would give from the perspective of somebody who's already boiled in that water? Uh, what's the key advice that you would give to young um, entrepreneurs and students, startups who are thinking about um, their first pitch perhaps? What should they do and what should they prepare for? Uh, I think for the most important uh, is to have a strong team behind you uh, with, who will help you with the pitch, who will help you with the startup. So the team and the um, board of advisors are the best way to go to the uh, to prepare the perfect pitch. This is the most important thing. Okay. Yeah, what I realize is uh, forget about your comfort zone and use every opportunity which can arise from somewhere, so just grab it. That's all. Okay, thank you. I think team is uh, yeah, quite important as well. So I have to mention, I have to um, emphasize on it. Um, also, you have to show what you have actually in terms of track record. So don't focus too much on um, the technical side and you have to show your vision, what you'd like to achieve, because usually that's in most cases what you actually have at that point. Okay, brilliant. 
So I would like to add that you can focus on two things. You can have the vision and team, or you can have the traction. If you have the numbers, that speaks for itself. So okay, thank you. We have two more people. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably like to share something which is not directly connected with pitching, but more with startups. Uh, the first thing is once you enter a startup, you understand why the team is that important. So uh, you should be sure that the person that you work with, you can work with. And very often, people that you know very well, you're not able to work with them. And the two things that are most important for the startup field, personally for me, are the first thing is character of the person, and second thing is the mindset, uh, that you can really be successful. because. If it's knowledge, you can learn it. If it's people in context, you can reach them via LinkedIn or somewhere else. But you should really try to uh, to be sure what you really want. Okay, thank you. So this is really a great bridge to what I'm about to say. Uh, when you're pitching in front of investors, you're not just trying to get the money of some people. This is not a bank that you're pitching in front. Uh, you're trying to attract a partner in your company, with their money, with their expertise, uh, with their knowledge for the domain, and uh, most importantly, with, uh, with the contacts that they will bring into your company. So try to approach it as you want to attract a partner. You want to get a co-founder who will help you, who will be with you along the way. And you should choose the investors that you want to attract in, in order to, to fit with them, both in terms of business, uh, business acumen and, and uh, business compatibility, but also in terms of uh, personal relationships. We are also choosing your investors. Okay, thank you. And Milena, you, um, from the perspective of uh, an investor and judge, what would be your advice for student entrepreneurs and student startups? Uh, first, I wanted to ask here in the audience, uh, are all of you thinking, who is not thinking to be, not to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> Half of the audience, so why are you here? Can you repeat the question? Who, who doesn't want to be an entrepreneur but is here? Okay, why are you here? Can someone... To make a decision, to learn more? So you, it's more to observe and what you're hearing here doesn't sound cool enough. Is that so? Or are you just still learning? Uh, well, <laughs> I, uh, one thing that I'm really passionate about is that I think entrepreneurship, being an entrepreneur really sh is becoming and is, should become uh, another career opportunity. And this to happen is, in order for this to happen, is um, we need to show more and more people uh, being uh, happy and successful in, when they are entrepreneurs. We need to show more and more role models and we need to include in our education. And I'm really, maybe it doesn't sound hard to say, uh, very inspirational to you, might, might even sound boring, but I tell you it's really important that when you are in school you are in functioning in a completely different environment. You are learning in a different way and you are growing with a different mindset because that is key. If you have the right mindset or attitude then you will, you know, position yourself, you will launch yourself onto a good start. If you have the attitude and the thinking, oh, maybe this is not possible, you're always saying, oh, I'm not sure, you're doubting, you're questioning, you are thinking maybe it's going to fail, that really is going to put you on the other side of track. So. To me, education is really key and I would uh, want to enroll you all that even through this experience we become advocates for education to change and to be more and more entrepreneurial, to be based on things that matter for us and that will be related to what we do after. And then I wanted to mention 
three things that I believe are trends uh, currently in the way startups are developing and entrepreneurship is uh, even um, the world is sort of uh, moving on. One is that it's about uh, we are becoming more and more a sharing economy, which means we are sharing our networks, we are sharing the way we promote, we advertise, we do business, but we are also sharing what we gain, the value or the benefit of what we are doing. Um, the second thing is, I was saying, is the, the trend is turning from us as the players or as the creators to the customer. So we really need to be very much orientated to asking, listening, hearing and creating that value, that difference for the customers. So we have to be very much service oriented, orientated, not the other way, not on us. And the third thing is, it's about also making people happier. And this might sound a little bit crazy, but I tell you, people really are driven by that. It's not by chance that they brought in this uh, new index of, you know, of happiness. And that is becoming something that matters more and more, even if you do business. So being an entrepreneur is also being happy about what